next address is one I've been especially eager for, as there are a few people, if any, who have had such a defining role in the development of impact investing in the UK and arguably globally as our acclaimed speaker, Sir Ronald Cohen. His career has been so varied and high achieving that I'm afraid that this short introduction will barely do it justice. Initially, I thought about describing his glittering credentials, completing a Harvard MBA as a Henry Fellow, founder and chairman of Bridges Ventures and the Portland Trust, founder director of the organization where I work, Social Finance, and of Social Finance US. But going into the details would simply take too long. His career has undoubtedly been impressive, but what makes Sir Cohen stand out is the scale of his vision, his ability to think big. He founded Apex Partners when venture capital barely existed in the UK, gaining himself a reputation as the father of British venture capital. He has pioneered and championed the adoption and development of social impact bonds globally, which some of you will have heard about in the session just before the break. He was instrumental in the launch of Big Society Capital, the UK's first social investment bank, and has been chairman of it since its launch in 2011. And he's now set to become an even bigger influence on the international impact investing arena as chairman of the recently formed G8 Social Impact Investing Task Force, for which Mr. Vineet Rai, chairman of IntelliCap, is a working group member. There are few people who would be better placed to talk about the evolution of impact investing than the aptly named father of social investment himself. So please give a warm virtual welcome to Sir Ronald Cohen. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure for me to be here uh, virtually with all of you in Mumbai. Can I just ask that you raise your hands if you can hear me? Can you hear me properly? Okay, perfect. So my, my task uh, today is really to try and, and share with you uh, my vision of uh, what is about to happen in the whole field of impact investing and to try and place it with my limited knowledge of uh, India uh, in, the, in the context uh, that uh, you face. And, and my comments apply not just to India, uh, but really to all the efforts of South-South cooperation, uh, which we are all involved in. We are all aware of the fact across the world now, uh, that the way that uh, our society deals with social issues uh, is not effective. Uh, philanthropists 150 years ago tried to find ways of tackling social issues, then government stepped in in the mid-1930s and philanthropists played a supporting role. And then we got welfare states in the mid-40s. And today governments are throwing their hands up at social issues and the challenges that face them. Virtually every government in the world has frozen expenditure on social services since the crisis in 2008. And the gap between government budgets and social need is increasing all the time not just as a result of the crisis, but also because of an aging population in many parts of the world. And the prospect of the elderly poor and the challenges that uh, they're likely to present are going to be with us for a long time to come. And so my own personal journey here today to this point has involved trying to do for social entrepreneurs, what we've been able to do for business entrepreneurs, which is to connect them to the capital markets. And over the last 10 years, big efforts have been made to achieve that, and a breakthrough, a breakthrough in thinking occurred in 2010, when the social impact bond was designed. And we went to the Ministry of Justice and we said to the Ministry of Justice, look, you have a major problem with young prisoners reoffending. Two-thirds of them here in Britain and across the world 
go back to prison within 18 months. We are going to suggest a new approach. We're going to raise five million pounds. We will deal with the prisoners released from a jail of your choice. We will fund not-for-profits. And if we fail over seven years to reduce the rate of reoffending by seven and a half percent or more, the five million pounds will be lost. If, however, we are able to reduce the rate of reoffending by seven and a half to fifteen percent, then the government will pay back the five million pounds and will pay an increasing rate of interest that will go from two percent to thirteen percent, according to the reduction. And the punchline, ladies and gentlemen, was that government would be paying out only a third to a half of the saving in the first year from preventing these young people from going back to prison. Not only improving their lives and creating an inflow of productive members into, into the economy, but registering a saving for itself. Now, why was this a breakthrough? This was a breakthrough because up until then, we had all assumed that we could not measure social outcomes. And this assumption had led to philanthropists giving money to not-for-profits for a year or two or three and saying, after that, go raise money from somebody else. And please don't spend any money on your overheads. Now we were moving into a world where a social entrepreneur whether it be the leader of a not-for-profit organization, which is usually the case where the community is important to achieving the social objective, or whether it be the leader of a profit with purpose business, like many of you in the audience today, where we say to those entrepreneurs, we have crafted for you the key to the capital markets. This is your form of empowerment now. If you can deliver social outcomes, favorable social outcomes, measurable social outcomes, you will be able to raise capital according to your ability to deliver them. Just as a business entrepreneur raises money according to his or her ability to deliver growth and profitability. And what's interesting about this breakthrough is that all of a sudden it begins to define a field of activity which is massive because there is huge demand on the part of organizations like those you lead for capital. There is huge supply of socially motivated capital. There's more than 10 trillion of socially responsible investment in the world which measures nothing more than generality. So there's huge demand on the part of investors and there's huge demand on the part of governments because what these forms of capital now, which seek to achieve measurable social outcomes provide, is venture capital for social organizations to deploy as innovation and as scale. And what we lack throughout the world are organizations with social objectives that have had the resources to engage in innovation and scale. And what you begin to realize when you work as I have been doing with the G8 countries and, and beyond, as you've heard, Vinit Rai is a member of the working group that's informing our task force, 200 of us across the world are working to support the work of the task force. And what we are discussing and what we are hearing comes back over and over to one word, revolution. Whether it be social entrepreneurs like yourselves, whether it be social investors, whether it be ministers, whether it be financiers, everyone is saying, 
We need a revolution in the way that we tackle social issues. Now, I come from the investment business, and I have been involved, like many of you here today, in a long journey to try to find the way of tackling social issues more effectively. I can see now, just as I could see when I started out at the age of 26 as a venture capitalist, that this field of impact investment is going to be huge. I feel about it today as I did in 1972 when I set out to be a venture capitalist. And I can tell you that as our working groups work in the areas of impact measurement, we are beginning to develop a vision for an accounting system in the years ahead that will look at social interventions, that will cost them, that will compare them to the savings that governments will be able to make for them, that will look at the price which charitable organizations are paying to achieve a social outcome and try to do better than that, and that will look at the value to society of achieving these outcomes. As we work on asset allocation, we can see the prospect of an investment approach across all asset classes, but also of an asset class within private investment classes, which can deliver 7% or more net of fees uncorrelated with interest rates or with indices. And as we work in the international area, we can begin to see distinctions between general economic development that goes to create profitable businesses that support employment and growth in wealth and social action, the funding of social delivery through development impact bonds, which social delivery affects the ability to achieve economic development. So you can imagine development impact bonds to work on the literacy rate, or on the dropout rates from education, or on the graduation rates from education. There are social impact bonds being designed at the moment to eradicate sicknesses. There's a Mozambique $30 million development impact bond being worked on. There's a sleeping sickness development impact bond for Rwanda that social finance is working on. And this distinction between straightforward impact investment for profit and the addressing through not-for-profits of social service delivery funded by development impact bonds that increase the accountability of those who are deploying the capital. The combination of these two forces should accelerate hugely the impact of the capital flows into developing countries. And as we look at profit with purpose businesses, which I assume is the majority of you in the room today, we are looking for corporate structures that lock in a social mission. Benefit corps have been created in the United States to allow a company not to maximize its profit in the search to achieve a social objective. The existing legislation in the United States allows two-thirds of shareholders to overturn that mission. But investors are already asking here in the UK and entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs are asking for a corporate form which locks in the mission even beyond the sale of the business so that the business will continue to be true to its social objectives as well as its financial objectives into the future. And so, as we look ahead 10 years, I think we can begin to see the creation of massive flows of capital to tackle social issues. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no other way to do so. Governments do not see a way to do so. 
Philanthropists do not see a way to do so. There is no other way than to bring the capital markets and the forces of innovation and entrepreneurship to act on social issues. And so we come to the question about each country's ability to create an ecosystem which is supportive of this. And the task force has spent a lot of time working on this. And India, I'm very pleased to say, has been working on the Indian ecosystem. And I know that you will have delivered to you after my comments a speech that looks at the Indian eco, as forgive me, a, a, a report uh, that uh, looks at the Indian ecosystem uh, and which looks to me as a really first-rate job at analyzing it. And as you look at India and you look at for-profit entrepreneurs, profit with purpose entrepreneurs, as we're now calling them, and entrepreneurs who prefer to use not-for-profit structures. The capital flows into these areas are going to come from different sources than other countries. They're going to come from corporates to a greater extent than in many other places in the world, although there are some countries where corporates play a, a, a big role, but it's certainly a minority of countries. You've had legislation under the latest Companies Act, as you all know, to allocate 2% of net profit to social purpose. If we are able to connect these flows of capital to impact investment, accountable for the delivery of social returns as well as financial returns, that in itself would be a huge strength of the Indian ecosystem. The role of foundations in attracting private sector capital by taking first loss provision, as we've seen the Rockefeller Foundation do recently in the United States, in a social impact bond that was launched by Bank of America Merrill Lynch, put together by social finance, and which attracted $13.5 million to tackle recidivism from private individuals in the United States, who would not have invested had the Rockefeller Foundation, first of all, not put its stamp of approval on the validity of the proposition from a social point of view, and secondly, help them to accept that the risk of loss would be attenuated uh, because of a first loss provision. And the combination of corporate capital flows, foundations attracting capital in their wake, and capital from the capital markets, from private investors and institutional investors who are interested to diversify their portfolios by investing in uncorrelated class. Those flows of capital in India look like being the bedrock of this new impact investment ecosystem. What we've discovered everywhere is governments have to play an enabling role. Even in countries where there is a tendency to think that things are done best without involvement of government, we are realizing that it is a necessary condition. And I salute your efforts in bringing together in the way that you have done the impact investment marketplace today. And it's an honor to address you and I'll be delighted to answer some of your questions. At the end of the day, We've all heard a lot about the invisible hand of markets. It's time to bring the invisible heart of markets to help those whom the invisible hand has left behind. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Sir Cohen. And I believe we have time for three questions. So if we could have hands up in the audience, anyone who has a question for Sir Cohen. Um, gentleman at the front here. Ronnie, it's great seeing you on screen. Thank you very much for the very uh, concise and clear definition of how markets are going to change uh, the way we tackle social problems. Uh, 
two questions. Okay. Oh, I guess one question. Do you see <laughs> large capital flows from the West okay. moving towards the markets that need them the most, whether it's India, Africa, okay. or other parts of the world? Uh, yes, the answer is we see it very clearly. If you look into capital flows to emerging countries since uh, 2008, you can see that the official development aid has stuck more or less at the same level and that private sector inflows of capital have increased very, very significantly to the extent that they represent today something over 60% of capital flows. Uh, and if you, look at, uh, if you look at philanthropy, philanthropy plays a smaller role than, the, than official aid and a much smaller role than private sector flows, but it has an important leveraging role in crowding in private investment behind it potentially. So I believe what we're going to see is a redeployment of official aid towards impact investment rather than grants. I don't know how far that will go. I know there are many representatives of development finance institutions in the audience today. It would be interesting to ask them the question. But here in the UK, uh, DIPID, our international development uh, governmental arm, has already staked out uh, scope for investing in impact investment funds for profits and, and uh, with non-profit uh, models and even outcomes funds that would pay out on the achievement of outcomes for development uh, impact bonds. But I think more generally, the world is going to be looking for investment classes that are uncorrelated with stock markets. And investing in developing countries provides an uncorrelated way of investing. And so I think you can expect to see providing impact investment provides the same rigor that venture capital and private equity have, have had and the same transparency uh, and so on. I think you can expect to see very significant flows of capital coming to countries like India. Thank you. And I think we have a question with the lady just sat a couple of rows back. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, thank you. Yes, I can. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Sir Cohen, for that uh, illumination. Uh, I work with an organization that does work in the urban space. And I often wonder when we use the word impact, uh, it's often overused. And the impact indicators that are handed down uh, from perhaps a northern context. Uh, what relevance is there attached to cultural sensitivity of these indicators? And uh, uh, looping back uh, a south context to the measurement of outcomes and indicators as well, because local contexts differ. And in measuring up to these outcomes, often we find that there is a mismatch. So what sensitivity is there? If not, how can one cultivate that sensitivity? I think, I, I think impact investment is going to be local. It may be part of a global movement and a global capital flow, but it's going to be local. And in the UK, again, as uh, my introducer said, we have created uh, a social investment bank funded with bank accounts that have been dormant for 15 years or more and which has attracted more than 400 million pounds from these bank accounts which have been separated from their owners and another 200 million pounds from uh, the leading four banks in the UK. So we have 600 million pounds of equity at big society capital to create investment intermediaries who know how to adapt the approach of impact investment to the local conditions. 
And so what is going to be crucial for India and every other country is to create investment management firms that may be part of larger groups, may be specialist firms, but that are focused on developing the expertise to set the right types of outcome objectives, the right types of metrics, and the right types of benchmarks. And to the extent that they are able to deliver uh, social performance as well as financial performance, those who do it better will raise more money and will grow bigger, just as happened with traditional venture capital. But it will have to be done at local level. And I think this, for young entrepreneurs or young investment managers, will be the next big thing, really, to define how they can manage to reconcile the approach of impact investment with the conditions that prevail in India and how to do it at scale. Great, and if there's one final question from the audience. Again, Rani, what are the, what are the lessons you think? In India, we have over 2 million NGOs, as you know. What are the lessons you think that India can teach in this area to other parts of the world? You know, I know, I know too little uh, about India, uh, frankly. I would like to know a lot more to answer that question. But if India's experience in the field of social entrepreneurship is akin to that which we have witnessed in tech entrepreneurship, then we have a lot to learn from India. Fantastic. Well, thank you for that. And I know that um, the chairman of IntelliCat, Mr. Vineet Rai, wanted to make a personal thank you for making the time to, to talk to us today. Thank you, Sir Cohen, for A, take on a very short notice accepting my invitation and addressing the gathering here. Uh, you're very right that we have a fairly sharp divide in India between the for-profit uh, businesses that are working with purpose and the not-for-profit philanthropic sector which has stayed on for a very long time. Uh, my belief is that uh, the government, which has actually played a fairly proactive role and potentially wants to play a proactive role but has still a long distance to go to understand the for-profit with purpose business, most likely would start engaging with, with us in case what G8 is doing and when its reports get published, Hopefully, there is a rub on effect to the G20. And as a participant, the Indian government most likely would start engaging far more proactively than what it has done. Uh, I would like to thank you. And uh, most, motive, most importantly, for the last statement that you made about the world learning from what is happening in India. I personally believe what has been happening in India with the kind of challenges we have faced and the kind of solutions that have emerged. There is a lot for us to learn from the world, but there's a lot for the world to learn from here as well. Thank you so much.